I'm Brandon Staglin. Thank you so much for watching and participating today. Today's topic is the mindset of a champion. As the Summer Olympics get underway in Tokyo, we look at the psychology behind competing at an elite level. What is the connection between mental health and sports? And what does it take to mentally, emotionally, and physically perform at the highest level for elite athletes in their competitions? And stick around later, we'll hear about a mental health app, which is popular, called Headspace. But first, we're joined now by Dr. Andrew Chen. He's the Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director for USA Nordic Sport, and also a team physician for the Olympics, the Olympic Games. Billy DeMong is a five-time Olympian in Nordic combined, a 2009 world champion, and the United States' first, very first uh, Olympic champion in Nordic skiing in 2010. Billy and Andrew, thank you so much and welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you for having us. Absolutely, it's great to hey, have Brandon, you here. It's great to be here. Likewise, Bill, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and viewers, feel free to post questions or comments in this webcast at any time. So uh, Andrew, may I start with you? Of course. Awesome. So first question is, what makes an Olympian? What are the mental attributes that are required to succeed on the world's biggest stages in sport? So I think there's no doubt that all Olympians possess athletic prowess, but even among Olympians, true talent like the kind that can't be acquired or learned is rare. But this actually gives the rest of us hope that with dedication and hard work, we can all achieve greatness in some way. There's an interesting, an interesting study was reported by Gould and coworkers in the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology. And after interviewing a cohort of Olympic medalists, they came up with a list of 12 attributes that were common. These attributes, things like competitiveness, mental toughness, confidence, goal setting, et cetera, these things are shared by those who succeed in any field. Even sport intelligence or the awareness and ability to quickly analyze the field of competition and adapt is something that's applicable in any field. Interestingly, raw talent was not one of those attributes. I think Olympians, like successful individuals in any field, take to the nth degree those attributes that we know are necessary for success. But beyond those characteristics, there are two attributes that really stand out among Olympians that are difficult to quantify or even measure. First is that elite athletes have the amazing ability to pivot. That is, they can rapidly discern whether something like a training regimen will take more hard work and perseverance or determine that's something that's just not working for them and make quick changes to something that does work. You know, the amazing thing about Olympians is that once they pivot, like a change of diet. They stick to it straight away. There's no easing into it. For them, it's like flipping a switch. That's something that most normal folks are unable to do or even comprehend. The second is resilience. Uh, many Olympians can recount a time of hardship or strife in their lives, like dealing with the death of someone close or overcoming injury that really galvanize, uh, galvanizes their resolve. But it's their ability to take that pain and anguish and turn it into something positive, something that motivates and inspires, that really makes them champions. Once they achieve this, it's as if any pain or setbacks that come their way serve to really fuel their determination, another challenge to overcome. This is unlike most normal people in whom such insight insults would probably negatively affect their performance. Mm. I love that message of any of us can learn some of these mindset attributes of, of resilience and, and, and the, the ability to have mental flexibility that model athletes model so well. I need to work on that some more myself. I have challenges <laughs> with mental flexibility. Um, and uh, I remember seeing an interview with, with, with Billy um, uh, uh, earlier in which he talked about um, a sense of balance and, and, uh, and wanting to, um, uh, knowing that even if he didn't win, he would still go on with his life. And uh, Billy, uh, you know, I'd love to pivot to you now, if you don't mind. Um, take us back a bit. How did your passion and drive for competition and sport and skiing first evolve? And how critical was mindset, do you think, uh, to your successes as they built over time to world championships and your ultimate success at the 2010 Olympic Games? Well, I mean, to be honest, like it was, it was really building myself into the kind of the attributes that Andy just discussed. Um, you know, naturally I feel like I'm a pretty innovative, adaptive, intellectual person. 
but, you know, coming out of high school, making a national team, you know, driving toward a goal of winning the Olympic games with my teammates. Um, it was a, it was kind of a tough road. Um, in that, you know, I didn't grow up born to be doing this. And that's why I think, you know, Andy highlighted, like we can learn to do these things. And so subsequent to my second game to where we had set some really high bars and we came up a little bit short, I was in a pretty tough mental state, you know, like very disappointed, not a lot of self-worth outside of my sport. And, and I took a year off, which was really due to an injury that I sustained outside of skiing. Uh, but then the net result was that I got a year to do what I wanted to do. And I, what I knew I wanted to do was to grow personally. And so I went back to school and I, you know, apprenticed under a construction uh, company in, a, a, in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is where I'm headed right now. Um, and I had a huge year of personal growth. And coming out of that year, I was able to really, um, you know, accept the things that had gone well and, you know, reposition myself from being like, I'm trying to win the Olympics at 21 to, I want to win the Olympics. I want to do it the right way. And it's got to be sustainable. And so going through that process, I was able to ascertain, you know, what was a feasible timeline and, you know, what were the appropriate goals to be like, you know, they were big and audacious and hairy and scary, but they were also, um, you know, they were achievable given the timeline. And what, what's fascinating to me is like looking in the rear, rear view mirror is seeing that I hit every single one on time in a 10 year period. Now I'm not going to say that's going to work every time, but you know, for me, it was really about distancing myself from the goals unto themselves and therefore being able to focus more on the process. And I think that's kind of the ultimate, you know, thing I'm going to come back to on this, this call is, you know, I knew it was like important to figure out a routine, not a ritual, not something that I, I just did because I thought it was good luck, but, you know, routines that delivered uh, measurable, uh, dependable results, whether it was stretching, you know, nutrition, what I ate, what I didn't eat, um, you know, how I warmed up, how I trained, et cetera. And I was able to build on that for a, a decade, essentially, to essentially realize the ultimate success. So <laughs> it's great. You were, you brought, brought it down to a science. You worked out a process by which you could, um, succeed over time in the journey, you know, making the journey count, um, while you were all on the way. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I have a similar, um, uh, admiration and, and I like routines too. Um, I, uh, when I get up in the morning, I exercise every morning, I meditate and I need to do these things to stay on an even keel to make good decisions throughout the day. And, um, so I, I, I empathize with that. Um, so, uh, and also Andrew, we know that physical training for Olympic athletes is grueling and intense. Their diet is extremely important as well. What would you say goes into a, a mental health regimen for athletes? Uh, how do you, what do you, how, what do you recommend promote good brain health? So, um, you know, each athlete is going to have his or her own routine with dealing with the pressures of training and competition. I think we now appreciate the fact that an athlete's psychological readiness for competition is vitally important for uh, his or her performance. For example, issues in an athlete's life such as financial stress or a recent breakup can really negatively affect the athlete's overall outlook on life and negatively affect their performance. On the other hand, elation or an overall sense of happiness and contentment can positively affect how that athlete performs. Uh, one thing you probably don't know is that at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, uh, Billy not only won gold and silver, but he got engaged to his lovely wife, Katie, I'm not sure if the knowledge that he was about to ask the girl of his dreams to marry him contributed to his success on skis, but that really was a nice engagement present that he gave himself nonetheless. 
So um, in training and competition, Olympic athletes um, have single-minded focus and determination with an intensity to which most normal individuals really just can't relate. And in order to maintain this degree of mental resolve, it's important for athletes to blow off mental steam during downtime by regularly focusing on activities other than their sport. For some, that means taking remote or online courses while others will read or play video games. Uh, you know, for a few years, um, Billy would actually trade penny stocks, even on competition days, and actually did quite well with it. Um, I distinctly remember being in his room one day prior to World Cup competition when just prior to leaving, he dropped a, like a couple thousand dollars on a stock. And at the end of the competition, he couldn't wait to get back to the hotel to see how he did. And I remember at the time wondering, like, how and why anyone at that level would dedicate any mental focus to anything other than the impending competition. But I realize now that, you know, this is what he did to take his mind off things, to, to set himself straight. Um, I think we now better understand that varying our mental focus, like Billy taking his year off, really allows us to better see the, be uh, the big picture, to psychologically bring us back to center and allow ourselves the mental grounding that is necessary to maintain that level of dedication. Wow, uh, I really love that. Hey, look, that I'm going to jump in real quick. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, Brandon, you know, this is great because Andy and I catch up on a weekly basis because he's obviously the medical director for our 40 athletes on the team that I now run. But to hear his insight into what he's experienced with us over the last decade is really interesting to me. And I will say, you know, it's not for every athlete. Everybody's individualized, right? But on a larger scale, as a successful human being, I think he's absolutely right. Like being able to just to your point, like get up, do yoga, go, go exercise, whatever makes you the most productive human is essentially where I think I got as an athlete and it allowed me to be, you know, successful. Um, so it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear that line of thinking because I encourage our athletes and I'm sure we'll get there. But, you know, if you need to take a year off, let us know and let's navigate that. Let's plan for it. Let's figure out how to make you a more successful human first, because if you feel good, um, you know, are able to function at the highest level, then you're going to see your highest potential outcomes come to fruition. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, um, you, you talked about uh, in your uh, interview that I, that I had seen about how, um, uh, well, so what Andrew mentioned um, that uh, you were planning to propose to your wife after that uh, that 2010 Olympic win, uh, that that was a major thing for you in your life at the time, and it it maybe gave you some balance, you know, while you were going through the uh, the process of training and competing. It, does that resonate with you, or how, how did that feel for you? Absolutely. I mean, I think that was the ultimate pivot, right? You know, like to go from, you know, waking up to win the last event of the games, you know, my, my ultimate dream on my goal sheet that was scratched on a piece of paper 10 years prior um, to also realizing that, you know, I've got to take care of this. When I have told the story about the 2010 Olympics, it really is not something about that day so much as things I learned over a 10 to 20 year career, which is, you know, on any given day, out of the 50 people that line up at the start, you know, 30 of them could win. It, there is a feasible pathway for most of the field to pull off a victory in our sport, right? There's outdoor aspects, there's, you know, young athletes, there's older athletes, you know, some have talent, some have experience, but the ones that tend to wheedle down through the day, it's almost like by after breakfast, you could take 30 and make it 20. Because 10 of them are like, oh my gosh, I didn't sleep well. I didn't have what I wanted for breakfast. It is what it is. Now you're down to 20. You know, then you get to jumping. And if the weather's bad, another five take themselves out. And then, you know, another five don't have a good jump. And then, you know, by the time you get to the start line, five are worried about their skis or the lack of, you know, uh, confidence in the, the wax and the skis that they've chosen with their team. And so then you end up with a few contenders at the end of the day. And so that, that ability to pivot is really interesting. And, you know, to your and Andy's, you know, questioning about my proposal, like that was obviously the ultimate pivot, like go from, 
I've got to win the Olympics today to I've got a ring in my backpack that my great aunt, you know, was <laughs> wore for 60 years um, and get this woman of my dreams to marry me. Um, that was it. That was a pivot. But it was also something that I think um, allowed me to balance myself through that day. You know, it's it's really important to be able to like turn on and turn off and to have other places to go while you're in the battle. And so I find that even now as an executive, like that ability is, is priceless, right? You know, Andy and I had a call 30 minutes ago, not about this call. It was about USA Nordic. It was about me. It was about him. It was about 10 other things. We didn't talk about this call hardly at all other than is this video or is this audio? You know, can I do it from the car? Do I have to find a place to sit? Um, that ability to pivot, get comfortable and focus in the situation, I think, you know, that's something I find invaluable in every day that I live. Wow. I admire the, the clarity of your mind, the ability to, to see where you need to go next and to, to go that way. Uh, that's, that's really amazing. Um, and, you know, Bill, we know as an Olympic athlete, you push yourself for a long time at the highest level, but you all compete in both solo sports and, and team sports. How do you find the experience of those two different types of sports differs for you mentally? Do you find that you find pressure from uh, it wanting to succeed for your teammates, or do you feel more like a la there's a layer of psychological support from your teammates in those grueling competitions? Well, I'll be the first to say I find way more value and um, reward in being successful as a team. So even though I find I find that my individual success is good, it's rewarding to me, it is not possible for me to do it without a team, and it certainly isn't rewarding without people to share it with. Um, and I would I would say that professionally for sure, but also as an athlete, I think, what allowed us to do what had never been done before in Nordic skiing was really about us coming together as a group, buying in, moving together to train together every single day. And the most important lesson I learned was it wasn't about who's out in front every day, so long as one of us was out in front and then everybody else could chase and rise to that level. And the best uh, anecdote that I have for that is honestly, um, my silver medal teammate, Johnny Spillane, you know, he and I traded leads a number of times during our careers. And it wasn't in Vancouver when I learned this. It was actually back in 2003 when he became the first American world champion in Nordic skiing. And what was important about that was, you know, we'd spent five years trying to get there together. And the year prior, I had the accident that I spoke to briefly earlier where I had dove into a swimming pool and ultimately like had a giant brain sprain and was not able to compete that year. And so, you know, I went through my year of personal growth, which was important to my career, but he rose to become the first American world champion. And so coming out of my year off, I was able to recognize, Hey, here's a guy that I've, you know, shared a room with a couple hundred nights. We've trained together a thousand days um, if he can do it, I can do it. It doesn't mean I'm going to say it out loud. It doesn't mean I'm going to tell him, but it gives me that personal confidence to know, like, if he can do it, I can do it. And that was kind of the mentality of our team that allowed us to rise together. And I think when you go after things alone, there's always that, there's always that easier cop out of, man, I've really gone at this hard for a long time. And, you know, quite frankly, I don't have any more to give. When you're part of a group, it's like, man, we're all going after this together. If somebody else can take a pull on the oars, I can, I can rest for a minute and come back and, and pull hard. And, you know, I think that's the kind of culture I try to build with my organization. It's something I've recognized from my youth uh, career in sports at like a junior level to a high school level where my team from New York was one of the top 25 running teams in America with like literally like a bare bones team. Um, and I feel fortunate to have been part of that. And then on to the, the USA Nordic combined team where we were able to achieve the ultimate success of the world stage. I will say I go to work with that kind of culture building mentality 
And, you know, as I go through life, I try to recommend to other leaders like this is it's not necessarily about the individual talents of your team. It's about bringing the team together to maximize the talents of the group. And, and I, and I have to great. say, I have to say, Brandon, I, I've worked with three or four directors of the uh, of USA Nordic, formerly USA Ski Jumping. Um, and I have to say that Billy's done a wonderful job. He really incorporates the team mentality into his managerial style. And uh -huh. I think this has really allowed the, the uh, teams and organization as a whole to really move forward. He, I think he understands that there's more at hand. It's not about his ego. It's not about yeah. trying to take care of everything himself. He's really good about delegating, really good about bringing people together. And like he said, he has an amazing ability to pivot. It's a, it's a, I, I, I hesitate to use the term ADD because he's not ADD. It's just, <laughs> he can be, uh, in a heated conversation with someone one moment, hang up the phone, pick up the other line and be 180 degrees the other direction. And wow. it's, it's an unbelievable ability that he has to utilize what he has, utilize his resources and propel the organization forward. Mental agility. Wow. Mental what, agility. what amazing quality that is. Yeah. Yes. And something uh, I, I'd like to learn more of, and I think we can all learn from in our workplaces and uh, our lives. So um, thank you for sharing that, Billy, and you too, Andrew. Uh, what a great, inspiring conversation this has been so far. Um, Billy uh, and Andrew, thank you for um, what you've said so far. We're talking today about the mental qualities that feed the uh, elite performance of Olympic athletes and champions and what it takes to achieve peak athletic performance with Dr. Andrew Chen, who is the chief medical officer and medical director for USA Nordic Sport and an Olympic team physician, and Billy DeMong, five-time Olympian and Nordic combined, a 2009 world champion and the United States' first Olympic gold medalist in Nordic skiing in 2010. Viewers, don't forget to post questions or comments for our guests at any time. And if you find that the insights that are being shared today by Billy or Andrew are useful to you or might be useful to somebody you know, please share this webcast with them and, uh, and spread, spread the word around. Thank you. Uh, Billy, back to you. Uh, you won gold and silver in Vancouver in 2010, and you're also now a father, as you mentioned earlier. Some Olympic athletes have talked about additional pressure especially gold medalists, to be the quote unquote, perfect role model. Have you ever felt that kind of pressure? Um, that's an interesting question because, you know, I definitely, you know, I'm constantly evaluating the balance I have, you know, life, husband, father, um, leader, you know, current athlete to a degree. Um, I don't feel a lot of pressure from others. I feel pressure from myself to uphold what I think is the right way to be. Um, so I'm not trying to punt that question by any means, but you know, I spend a lot of time and I, I do it on a monthly basis, you know, like, am I coming home awake and alert and ready to plug in as a father and a husband and a, you know, a partner and a leader for, you know, my team. I don't know. I, I honestly, I struggle to answer that question only because it's an evolving process for me. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great answer. Uh, that's kind of what I was getting at. You know, the, I, I feel the same way. And, and my dad was like that too. He still is. Uh, we push ourselves and, and have that intrinsic motivation uh, to, to push ourselves farther. Um, so uh, amazing that you, you have that too. Um, and Andrew, you're an orthopedic surgeon. Um, are, are the mental strengths that have made elite athletes tops in their profession also something that they can bring to bear to get through those tough times, like, uh, injuries like Billy experienced and how do you help them build emotional resilience for those tough times? Um, so yes, uh, elite athletes are curious in the way that they deal with injury and other setbacks. Um, you know, as Mark Twain once famously said, it's not the size of a dog and its bite, it's the size of the fight and the dog. And as a sports medicine surgeon, I would say that most non-athletes after injury and especially surgery um, typically decide to either change activities or pursue activities 
at a lower level of intensity. Um, I think it's the athlete that will get back on the horse, so to speak. And it's the elite athlete that will say, challenge accepted and rededicate themselves to purpose, often coming out of injury with increased intensity and, you know, laser focus to win, uh, as Billy intimated before with his experience. Um, you know, resilience is a psychological trait that's really difficult to train as it takes repeated insults to oftentimes to determine one's mm -hmm. resilience. Um, that said, elite athletes often demonstrate emotional resilience that surpasses that of normal individuals. At the elite level, uh, most of those athletes will, or many of them anyway, will have sustained injuries and surgeries that they've had to overcome. Uh, that said, coaching emotional resilience in this group isn't necessarily difficult as they share the same determination to get back and win. But by breaking down the path to return into digestible pieces, like by week four after surgery, you'll have this range of motion. And by week 12, we expect this amount of strength. Um, you set up these small wins for the athlete that really boost their confidence and increase their result. But bear in mind that these are very uh, goal-oriented people from the start. And by setting progressive goals to achieve, uh, we not only get to the finish line, but increase their resilience as well. That's fantastic. And uh, um, it, it seems to work very well with your team, uh, Billy being an example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and Billy, you're, as, you, as we talked about, you're now the executive director for USA Nordic Sport. That's another pivot that you've done in your life. How did that pivot go for you, making that life transition from a champion athlete to the, uh, the leader of this major organization? Well, you know, I'll be honest, like coming out of my career, um, I had built up a tremendous network of people and, you know, different knowledge bases. Um, what I didn't see coming was that the resource allocation in the Olympic movement was going to get so tight that, you know, basically I wouldn't say it, it's my legacy, but the legacy of the sport was going to be under threat. And so, you know, coming out of the 2014 games, uh, 2010 games, actually, uh, you know, ski jumping was identified as not a metal hopeful, uh, discipline, uh, by the U S ski and snowboard association. Mm. And, uh, there were other disciplines that fell into that bucket. Um, and out of 2014, you know, our team failed to medal. Um, and so we were lumped into that and I just found that not to be acceptable. So it was easy for me to transition to the board. I actually spent a year being a marketing director for a cycling company and enjoyed that. And I, I got a lot out of it, but when, um, when push really came to shove, I realized that just like, you know, setting a 10 year plan to become the Olympic champion with my teammates, and I always hide behind the team as much as possible because I really don't like dragging that medal around nor, you know, being out in front necessarily. But I do find, you know, like I will I will I will play the role if needed. Um, you know, I found that, like, despite all my best efforts to avoid the job I have, um, there was nobody better positioned to do it. So I took on the role. And, you know, I think my experience from my athletic career coupled with some of the business ex experience that I had gained, you know, through my cycling uh, stint, as well as things that Andy alluded to in the 15 years in between that I did outside of skiing um, to make ends meet and develop myself, you know, personally and professionally paid dividends. And so, you know, the transition was not that hard, honestly. The biggest thing for me, which is an ongoing thing, is how to, you know, achieve how to get a large community of stakeholders to agree on what the goals are and then how to go about achieving them. And I, you know, look, I think we're on a really good track, but I find that to be the hardest part of what I do. So Andrew, how can non Olympians, that's the rest of us in other workplaces or professions cultivate the kind of mindset necessary for a high performance life? Um, so I, I think that's a really great and relevant question in this day and age. I think that in this age of positivity, it's really great for all of us to imagine the possibilities of what we can achieve or who we wish to be. 
But, um, you know, the real problem with that way of thinking is that we really tend to think in terms of nebulous concepts, like I want to be more successful or I want to be an athlete. But in order to achieve these monumental tasks, we really need to come up with a plan. Um, it's easiest to begin by eliminating those bad habits that ultimately prevent us from ever reaching our goals. Um, Olympians as a group tend to follow several basic principles that allow them to simplify their lives and excel. Uh, the first is don't overcommit. If you want to get into shape, for example, you start simple and you gradually build from there. You don't want to feel overwhelmed or overburdened from the outset by jumping into a heavy routine. Uh, the key to success with that is to make it habitual. It's much better to hit smaller home runs. Uh, that will give you a sense of pride and satisfaction and ultimately result in improved performance. Uh, number two, don't overthink things. Um, I think that in this day and uh, age of technology, we tend to focus on things that we can measure. You know, we all have our uh, smart watches now. We will like to do things like count the steps that we walk or the calories that we burn or what our heart rate is. And in doing so, this can really drive you crazy and cause you to lose sight of the goal of living your best life. Instead, it's more important to see the big picture, but keep the goal in mind, but have fun with it. I think it's important to allow your creativity and passion to come through. And that's where you're really going to see success in your life. Uh, number three, you don't want to over restrict yourself. If you're trying to improve your diet, for example, overly restricting yourself will just lead to feelings of deprivation and defiance. Instead, you should allow yourself occasional liberties, but only on special occasions. You don't want to make your bad habits habitual. And number four, you don't want to dwell on the negative. Uh, things don't go our way. It's just life or don't always go our way. It's just life. But focusing on a bad outcome or feeling sorry for yourself or ruminating about what could have been or should have been, these things carry a lot of psychological weight. They're emotionally draining and ultimately the outcome can't be changed. Instead, we should really make room for constructive, positive things like gratitude and self-confidence and rededication for purpose. So, for example, if you come in second place, you don't sit there and say, oh, man, I came in second place. You should be happy you came in second place because that's really good. It's not the top, but it's really good. Um, and this really speaks to emotional resilience and the ability to come back stronger. This is one of the true hallmarks of what makes an Olympian. And then we've touched upon this multiple times, but probably the number one thing, and Billy has, you know, uh, Billy takes this to heart. Perhaps no attribute is more characteristic of an Olympian than the ability to make rapid, decisive changes for the better. The typical athletic career of an Olympian is finite and short. And as such, the ability to pivot is almost of necessity in order for them to achieve success. But a lot goes into the ability to pivot. Uh, dedication, resolve, strength of character. This speaks to why Olympians are who they are. Um, this itself is a huge topic, but if you think about those at the highest level of just about anything you can think of, medicine, sports, business, academia, you name it, they all seem to share the same capacity to shed undesirable habits in favor of ones that allow them to succeed. So, you know, those are really sort of like the top five things that I've noticed over the years that Olympians really share uh, as a group, even if, say, they don't like each other, but they still share those same core characteristics. That's incredible. And uh, I really wish I could do that better pivot. And so um, I'm learning a lot from this webcast and hopefully uh, can put that into practice. Um, Andrew and Billy, one of this year's Olympians, Naomi Osaka, has been very brave and honest about her own mental health when she withdrew from the French Open recently. How can we help elite athletes feel more empowered to be open about mental and emotional challenges? You know, Brandon, one of the biggest, biggest things we deal with is trying to make good humans, because in my mind, like, that's what I get out of bed to do. It's like less about the medals. It's more about like creating great opportunities and, and facilitating a great, uh, you know, learning process for our athletes to try to maximize their potential. Um, so we do. We run into a lot of people who struggle at times and we try to create, you know, resources for for them through clinical and sports psychology resources to navigate their personal challenges. But on the, on the flip side, we're also, you know, somewhat of a business that has to worry about the day to day. And I apologize if the noise is crazy now, but you know um, we have to make sure that we're stewarding along the programs and the athletes that we can support given our limited resources. 
So, you know, I, I'll best summarize and just say, I think athlete mental health is a big piece of what we do. It's certainly in the top five of, you know, like training programs, which includes coaching, um, coaching being a huge one, nutrition, uh, psychology, um, financial resources. And uh, there's another one I'm going to come up with. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think the biggest thing is in building good humans is really being able to say, we're not, you're not able to uh, focus on your sport and we're not able to help you to the, to the level you need. And I think what Naomi did was really good because she called it out for what it was. So the organization isn't liable to try to navigate that and she's able to get the help she needs. So when she's ready to plug back into her professional career in sport, you know, that she is, uh, you know, best positioned to do so. Does that make sense? And Andy, do you want to comment? Yeah, you know, times have changed a lot. I think, you know, fortunately, we've reached the day and age in which it's not only socially acceptable, but even laudable that a star athlete like her can have the courage and conviction to come forth publicly about mental health issues. And, you know, we congratulate her. You know, in the past, athletes would really be reticent to come forth with issues due to fear of reprisal, such as being pulled from competition or public ridicule. But, you know, the days of the coach saying, you know, get your head straight and get back in the game, those days are over. And we now very much encourage our athletes to speak openly with us, with coaches, with other athletes and sports psychologists. Um, I, I think we realize that by getting athletes to deal with their mental health issues head on, it not only cultivates the athlete, but also lets them know that we're there for them to take care of their physical and psychological well-being. And the knowledge that we've got their backs not only inspires confidence in that athlete, but it also improves and enhances the team dynamic. Yeah, that, that support, that psychological safety that comes from that support is essential in any workplace, I think. And um, it's amazing that you do that for your team. So wonderful. Uh, finally, we come to the lightning round, which is five quick questions with quick answers, which will pose to each of you in turn. Uh, are you ready? Absolutely. Okay. We'll start with I'm Andrew ready. and circle. All right. Thank you. We'll start with Andrew and circle around for Billy's answers. Andrew, what helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, two things. Um, number one, working out. And number two, spending time with my family. I think the physical exhaustion mentally grounds me and seeing my kids grow up really reminds me of what's important in life. Love that. What helps you when you're, uh, when you're feeling down? What song or type of music do you turn to? That's easy. Classic rock, especially ACDC. Um, it's <laughs> what I grew up with and it's almost like comfort food to me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Which Olympic sport will you be watching most closely in Tokyo? Uh, I'm going to watch as much of it as I can, but I'm going to be paying uh, special attention to swimming. Um, a 16 year old daughter of a friend, her name is Claire Curzon, just qualified for the 100 meter butterfly. So I'll certainly be rooting for her. Wow. That's a great thing to support uh, your friend's daughter. What is one thing you've never told an interviewer about yourself? Uh, so I've been plant-based for eight years now, but prior to going plant-based, um, I prided myself on making insanely good beef jerky. And I still make beef jerky for friends, uh, but I don't eat it myself. I'm actually about to uh, make a batch to send along to athletes on the U.S. team. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, cooking and preparing <laughs> food. It's so, so soothing, I think. I, I feel that for me. Great for you. What gives you hope? Um, I think what gives me hope is that societally, I think we're increasingly approaching a time in which we don't really have to hide things, whether it be issues of mental health, addiction, gender issues, etc. I think we increasingly want to support each other. And that gives me hope that as a global culture, we're headed in the right direction. Billy, what helps you cope when you're going to, through a tough time mentally? You know, Brandon, it's honestly, it's, it's really about having that balance that we are, we talked about, you know, it's about having enough things that are important to, to remind yourself that win, lose or draw, the sun's going to rise, your mom's going to love you, you know, that you've got kids to go home to. Um, so, you know, I try to really, I think the biggest lesson that I learned in my life is like, it's best to go. Like you have everything to win and nothing to lose. 
Oh God, what a wonderful philosophy. I love that. When you're feeling down, what song or type of music do you turn to? So I'm going to go with Andy on almost all of this, but I'll try to reframe it. Um, <laughs> I'm a big classic rock guy. In fact, I think I cost uh, a lot of people a lot of money because I once shot a commercial for Citibank. And, you know, originally the script said, when I do cross country, I listen to country. I said, no way, I don't do that. <laughs> so we got Jimi Hendrix instead. And I can only imagine how much his estate was paid. <laughs> <laughs> you never do okay. that. That's, that's, that's being authentic. That, that's wonderful. Um, which Olympic sport will you be watching most closely in Tokyo? The truth. Track and field. There nice. is oh. nothing truer in our world than the amount of time it takes to run around an oval, you, how far you can throw something that is measured to a gram, you know, how far you can jump if you take off before the line. I love it. The naked hey, Brandon, truth. Brandon, just, just as an aside, you have to get Billy to tell you the story of his first marathon, okay? Because he ran it off the couch in, what, 222, 223? No, 232. Oh, 230. It was windy. <laughs> That's no slouch. That's it was amazing. New York. Wow. That's incredible. That could be our, for our next broadcast together. So, you know. Yeah, he's yeah. biased. Yeah. <laughs> that's heroic it was a legit um, field that's amazing uh good for you billy wow um and what is one thing maybe this this was it maybe what is one thing you never told an interviewer about yourself i mean to be honest i'm a as you've discovered a pretty transparent guy i think the one thing that i've never brought up into an interview is that i'm actually an introvert so take it for what it is but <laughs> I still find uh, my biggest strength or, you know, like where I get strength is spending time alone. So, uh -huh. you know, given all that I love to do and, and how much I love people, I still need to get out there and whether it's, you know, go for a run and a swim in a lake that I've never been to or whatever, that's where I, I find my, my inner strength and peace. That's so cool. Yeah. I love my alone time too. And what gives you hope? You know, what gives me hope is that, you know, Andy actually spoke really well to this, but the world is fast evolving, changing and adapting. And I think much to the needs of a larger, uh, you know, slice of humanity. And, you know, as a member of the movement, as an athlete, as a leader, um, I see that, you know, the United States took a global leadership role 40 years ago with the Ted Stevens Amateur Sports Act, which was really something that came out of uh, what we all know as pre-Fontaine days. Um, but, you know, we're in a reset period now. Uh, Congress passed a piece of legislation last year called the Olympic Reform Act. I've, you know, really stayed in touch with that. And I think this is going to be the American opportunity to lead the world again. I love that, that, uh, that hopeful inspirational statement uh, that the U.S. will lead the world again in sports. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you both. Thank you so much for being on One Mind Brainwaves today. Now on to our One Mind Cyber Guide team for a review of a popular mental health app called Headspace. Here we go. Hello, my name is John Bunny and I'm a digital mental health specialist at One Mind Cyber Guide. We spend lots of time talking to people about mental health apps, what they like about them and what they don't like about them. In our research, we've heard from lots of people that one barrier to using mental health apps are concerns about privacy and security. This is understandable as in some cases you might be entering sensitive private information about your well-being, which you don't want other people to see. Just like any other technology you use, you should only use apps you trust and are confident in their ability to protect your data. Any app you use should have a privacy policy that informs you about how the app handles your data. In a recent study, we found that over half of apps for depression don't have a privacy policy. You can check for a policy in the App Store at the bottom of the app page. If an app doesn't have a policy or you are unsure of the security of the app, avoid using it.
At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review privacy policies to check if key pieces of information about what happens to your data are covered in the policy. We believe developers should be as transparent as possible about how they handle data, so you can make informed choices about the apps you use. Headspace helps users to develop skills around meditation and mindfulness. The app's core feature is a series of animated videos which walk the user through a variety of meditation exercises. Consumers can select topics of interest to them and add recordings that they enjoy to their favorites. There are specific individual meditations available, as well as entire courses centered around broader topics such as grieving, happiness, and relationships. There are options to do quick bite-sized meditations in the SOS section and meditation timers for those who are simply needing a timer for their meditation practice. Users can also join a group meditation with others in a virtual space. In addition to these meditation options, Headspace offers specific sections to help consumers with their sleep, with exercise and physical activity, and for work and productivity. Consumers can also search for meditations that they might need in a given moment. Finally, consumers can review their history of meditation exercises and various other statistics to understand their progress in learning mindfulness and meditation skills. Headspace is one of the highest scoring apps on the One Mind Cyber Guide app guide, scoring five out of five on credibility and 4.97 out of five on user experience. It has acceptable transparency around data security and privacy. We also have a professional review of Headspace where you can read more about the app from a clinician's perspective. In our mental health resources section, you can also read more about Headspace with pieces like five tips for using Headspace. Also check out our blog pieces from our team on their experience using Headspace for a month. Stay tuned next week for another app review. Thank you, One Mind Cyber Guide team. What an incredible review. Thank you, Dr. Andrew Chen, and thank you, Billy DeMong, for being with us on One Mind Brainwaves today. You were incredible. Thank you, Brandon. Hey, Brandon, this was a, this was a blast. So. <laughs> yeah, seconded. <laughs> yeah. And don't forget, audience, viewers, viewers, thank you, too. And don't forget, you can post questions and see all of our back episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and receive updates on upcoming Brainwaves episodes. Thanks, everybody, for being with us today. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Mental health is stepping out of the shadows and into the spotlight. I think I need help. Can you talk? Struggling. I'm here. Depressed. Can't sleep. But we need the science and solutions to change lives. Now, more than ever, we are in this fight together. We are of one mind. Accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org.